Hello and welcome to the Yellow Jackets Hive. I am Media Melanie here with and I'm Emily. And today we are going to break down the Yellow Jackets Cannibal Council from like big picture down to the fine details. And we have a guest joining who we'll be bringing on very soon. Um, Emily, can you explain why the fandom calls it the Cannibal Council? Well, we call them the Cannibal Council for obvious reasons because we suspect that the meat that the group is eating is Pit Girl. And that also made me think about in the adult timeline when Natalie questions Misty for eating the beef jerky. She's like, jerky, really? Yes. So yes. that kind of made me think like that was a person too. <laughs> Absolutely. I love the name Cannibal Council. Our fandom is like so clever. I love that about us. Um, let's go ahead and start the spill talking about a concept called archetypes um, and how this concept may have shaped the hierarchy in terms of how Ashley and Bart envisioned this Cannibal Council. Uh, Emily, what are archetypes? So archetypes are a constantly recurring symbol or motif in literature, painting, or mythology. This definition refers to the recurrence of characters or ideas sharing similar traits throughout various seemingly unrelated cases in classic storytelling, media, etc. This usage of the term draws from, co from both comparative anthropology and from, I don't know exactly how to say that word. Jungian, I believe. Carl, okay. Carl Jung, I, I believe. Okay. Ar archetypal theory. The archetypal Archetypes reveal shared roles universal among societies. Yes. Um, and, you know, we find archetypes in fairy tales. Yes. Fairy tales are short stories that belong to the folklore genre. Such stories typically feature magic, enchantments, or mythical, fanciful beings. On that note, let's welcome Nerdist News Editor Ro Rusak to talk about the Yellow Jackets characters as um, fairy tale archetypes from your exceptional article. Welcome, Ro. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I definitely love this article looking at Yellow Jackets through this fairy tale lens. I think it's really interesting because I think one of the major questions the show kind of poses but never really quite answers is, is, is there like something supernatural at play in the show? Yeah. Or is it just like this madness, this scientific thing, like Ty says, there's an explanation for everything. Um, yeah. And I think that it confuses viewers from, from my perspective because the sort of initial points where they're at the school and the pep rally and all of that, that feels very realistic. So we're like, hey, mm -hmm. we're grounded in our reality. And that's like a very hard thing to overcome. And then you're like, okay, so this is like a survivalist work of realistic fiction. But then of course, in the wilderness, you're in a kind of in a different world. I really think that it's almost like you can look at going into the wilderness as this portal where you leave that realistic fiction behind and you're now transported into something that's much closer to this mythology, to a fairy tale, if you will. Yeah. And I really think that those early kind of scenes where they set up this antler queen and she has this court around her really set you up to understand it. Exactly. Thank you. Really set you up to understand that aspect of the show as this fairy tale. And I think that as we're kind of watching season one, we can really see these different archetypes emerge with these really intense like symbols that these different like fairy tale types will have in other, you know, mythology and fairy tales that we'll read and we can see them sort of transcribed onto yellow jackets. Yeah. Absolutely. And in your article, you kind of list out character by character and what their role as a fairy tale archetype is. Let's start with uh, Lottie, the queen of antlers and the priestess. Exactly. So I think Lottie is like the really obvious one, right? Because we're given this idea of the antler queen. And of course, we don't like know for sure that the final antler queen is Lottie. But so far, we've really been led to believe that. And then especially, I think all of these come become really salient in Doom Coming um, in episode yes. nine, because right when they're all gathered, kind of they've hunted Travis, who's become this stag. And 
there she is. She dons her crown and suddenly everybody is kind of doing what Lottie says. They're following Lottie. She's the one who's kind of giving orders. She orders Shauna to like kill Travis. She tells Jackie she has to go into exile. She's like left and right giving these orders. So she really takes on this role of queen and you can really see suddenly this court around her and they're in this kind of magical place. And that's real, that's real to them, it's real to us. Um, so I think that that that's like this that salient moment where you can really see all those archetypes come to life around you. And then, you know, I also think Lottie is a priestess because she has this, um, spiritual essence to her that's given to her mm -hmm. in a sense by Laura Lee. But Laura Lee like can't survive in the wilderness. The wilderness has to like destroy her because she comes from this really normative place that has no like room in the fairy tale. There's no room for these like Christian gods in this like big fairy tale because it's a pagan place now. It's this like yes. wild visceral experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's also really interesting that you can see Lottie has a scar right here. It's kind of mm -hmm. like she's been crowned by the forest and also like anointed kind of like. Oh, I love that. Like a metaphorical like, crown. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She has that yeah. mark right there. So she's kind of been like enshrined. Um, and that, and I mean, you can see symbolism of that, you know, she kind of, she goes up these candlelit stairs in her vision and she's kind of like got this halo, this this glow, and kind of the way you might like see like a Jesus figure or something like that, a leader or, you know, this divine right to rule for Lottie from, from the wilderness. Um, because when Laura Lee gives her this baptism, this, you know, washing away of her past self she's baptizing her in the wilderness so it's like mm, yes. Laura Lee thinks she's giving her this like Christian right but really she's like she's putting her into the waters of, of the woods so it's really like this this magical you know bathing to like prepare her for her coronation or what have you I'm um, Yes. Um, yeah, and, I love that. <laughs> yes. You mentioned, um, you know, Shauna and Travis at Doom Coming, right? Yes. And you pegged down Shauna as the executioner. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that archetype. Yeah. I think that's, again, like this other one that just really stood out to me. To me, it felt like so obvious because Shauna is like always reaching for the knife, you <laughs> even yes. in her like future life. I'm, she's killing these rabbits. Yeah. she's she's the one who says oh I'll gut this deer like that becomes her role like so she's like in kind of this business of blood and I think if you think about like Snow White is like this really famous fairy tale that has like a huntsman but there's huntsmen that appear yes. like throughout kind of maybe Hansel and Gretel has one I'm not, I'm not super clear on every instance but I feel like it's this role that you see this like this knife of the sovereign who's usually maybe a little evil. Um, although I think we, we don't yet know. I think that's also a big question the show will address is like, is it really evil to take on this like fairy tale persona? Is shedding society to kind of make your own new society in this like magical realm really like bad is what the the girls are struggling really that they liked that and now they've returned to society and they're ordinary again. And that's what mm -hmm. they don't enjoy. Kind it's a big, of. big struggle. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, a, a big change. Um, and Van, now we know adult Van has survived and we'll see her, you know, played by Lauren Ambrose in season two. Cannot wait. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You you called Van the knight. I did because I think that in sort of medieval folklore and in a lot of these sort of Arthurian tales and things like that, that the queen is always like bestowing a favor on her knight. And to me, Lottie giving this antler bone to Van really like read of this, like, I give you my favor. I protect you with this symbol of me and then you protect me by you know, leading my battle cry. And I think toward the last episodes, you can really see that Van has kind of picked up for Lottie. She's really believing what Lottie has to say. She's even fighting with Thaisa about it, which is like intense mm -hmm. because they just connected really intensely in the episode before. But now Van is like, I believe this. 
this is kind of my queen, like in a sense. Um, and she she bows down to her, you know, with yeah, the, and 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 the Misty end, bow she's down. Kneeling. <laughs> she's kneeling ostensibly, they're kneeling to the wilderness, but they are kneeling behind Lottie. So yeah. yes, I think there's also a question of like, is Lottie really in charge of anything or is she just being enshrined by some greater power and then that power could always choose somebody else um to be there to be their queen so yes we'll and just have to see speaking of queens um <laughs> Thaisa, you noted was queen of the wolves mm -hmm. and the wolf is of course the natural enemy of the deer now that's interesting yes. yeah i didn't know that yeah i mean i I think, I don't know, it's been a minute. I believe wolves eat deer, don't they? I'm, but the, no stuff, the wolf is definitely a predator and yeah. the deer, you know, and the deer is definitely like a different sort of creature. Um, so I think I think we see those two animals like strongly feature in, um, feature in the first season. We see the deer symbolism a lot around Lottie. We see the wolves. Mm -hmm. They're not super clearly around Ty in the wilderness, but then Ty sees them when they leave the wilderness the most, yeah. notably. Um, and I think Ty is really a queen. Um, so so it's um, we'll see how that develops or if that develops. I think um, the actress has spoken about Ty's connection to the wolves as well um, in, in several interviews, including one that's on our site. So check it out. Um, and I think she does feel that Ty has this connection to these wolves. These wolves are these like, you know, intense, fierce animals. And Ty, we see, has this fierceness inside of her. And she has mm -hmm. carried this wilderness side of her back home, even though she's not fully cognizant of it. Um, so it will be interesting to see um, to see that play out further. But we do know there are two factions and already there's like this division between Lottie and Ty. They haven't maybe clashed as overtly as Lottie and Jackie had, um, but they're pulling in different directions. So Yes. Yeah. And you know, when we interviewed Marie Schley, the costume designer mm -hmm. for Yellow Jacket, she actually told us that Ty was wearing a wolf fur. So, oh. you know, that was another, um, another tie-in. So, I think, you know, we're going to get more into like the specific animals, but I think that wolf symbology is, is definitely um, surrounded. Tied to tie. Tied to tie. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. That's very cute. Yes. And um, Misty as uh, the witch. Misty, I think, is an amazing witch. You see, she has her little book of herbs. Like that, <laughs> I feel it's like such a witchy, like, symbol when she's kneeling in the ground she's pulled this huge binder of like just dried herbs and plants and mushrooms she has her little book she's like what do these do she's putting them together she's poisoning people oh you need a witch to poison people yes and um, and i didn't note this in the article but she has a familiar she has caligula so that's very witchy um of her mm -hmm. to, to have that like pet creature that she like refers to as her friend who's her partner in crime kind of so i think that really like drives home the i'm um, the witchy aspect and just one thing that i thought i'd mention um is that like when things are getting kind of fairy tale-y in the modern timeline that's when we hear that eerie vocalization comes back it's like present a lot mm. in the past um but then when something's happening when ty sees the wolf or you know when shauna's got the knife she's killing the rabbit that like howling starts up again around them so i think that's kind of like our like in to this like okay things aren't natural anymore now they're like in the realm of the supernatural again Absolutely. Um, the courtiers, you mentioned uh, Mari yes. and Akila. Yes. Once again, I just feel like they just like you can see them in those roles. They're oh, kind absolutely. of these free agents. They're flitting around. They're talking with Jackie. They're, you know, confiding in, with Ty. Now they're following Lottie. They're here and they're there. And you don't like really know like where their loyalties will ultimately lie but they are very important players because obviously you can't just have like head honchos if nobody follows you you have no power so i think that 
kind of where they tie in, if they stay together, if they come apart. I think that will be very interesting to see. But they're definitely like fill that like royal court kind of kind of place. They kind of the seem team. like they go they kind of seem like they go hand in hand too. Like one mm-hmm. always follows the other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you can just like see them kind of just like in the halls of the palace, just like gossiping and giggling and being yeah. like, who do who do our loyalties lie with? I'm and I think you can really see even in the Yellow Jacket season two trailer that they have this fancy feast and they're twirling around bonfires. So I think there's definitely gonna be like feasts and festivities for like our court. <laughs> yes, yes the royal feast the royal feast definitely yes um and then coach ben the queen mother <laughs> slash the fool mm-hmm. i think that this one is like a another great they're all great i think this one is another like excellent in i um, because definitely he's this kind of like mother figure if you will out there he's like now don't go off, you know, into the woods, girls. Don't fly the plane. But no one is listening to him anymore. But he doesn't really realize even even <laughs> into the end that he doesn't have any power anymore. Like yeah. somebody has held a knife to somebody else's throat and he's still like, if I tell you not to do something now, don't do it. And <laughs> like, They're like, he, okay, he, mom. Right, exactly. He has he has no kind of power in this new this new story that they've landed in. But he too is still, you know, stuck in this old world where he had any kind of authority over the land. <laughs> yes, he's definitely lost his credibility towards the end. I think he's um, shed any authoritarian uh, figure. And um, yeah, he's not in charge anymore. Our antler queen is very much in charge. (laughs) Uh, Travis, the damsel, Mm. tell us more about that role. Yeah, you know, Travis, he's just, he's just never got getting it together um, in the (laughs) wilderness. He's always getting into one trouble or another. He can never really get himself out of trouble ultimately he gets himself into the most trouble because we see he dies i'm in a sense really for nat's arc um although he takes up a lot of space in nat's arc in season one um but mostly he's taking up space making a problem that he doesn't need to make that he then needs to be rescued from himself from um so there's just he's really that like damsel he's always just like falling into trouble and needing somebody to get him out of it. (laughs) Yes. And, you know, you mentioned that um, you have her as the rogue knight. And I think that is so spot on. Tell us about that role. Yeah. I think what we see about Nat is that she's like, she's thinking a lot about, you know, her own, what, what she wants to do. She's not really that concerned with like, these structures of social power, who's following who, like she's kind of, you know, this loner figure before, and that kind of continues in, she's, she's like, she'll join kind of groups, but really only because of what she believes is in her best interest, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. She's not really concerned with these factions, but she is an active player, of course, we see. Yeah. Yeah. She absolutely is. And then, oh, poor Javi, the innocent. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I think that is like a trope we see all the time. And usually in these fairy tales, like the innocents are like at center, you know, like in the Lord of the Rings, you have Frodo or, you know, these chosen ones that you get that like have to save the world. Javi isn't like front and center in our story, but we don't know where his path is going, but he is just this kind of like this sweet younger child. He hasn't become embroiled in even sort of the dirty business of being a teenage (laughs) girl, so to speak. Like he's still much younger than the rest of them. He really just seems to want to like be apart, be close to his brother, you know, so I think it's hard to say what, what will happen. I think 
probably in yellow jackets, just realistically, that innocence will somehow be broken. Um, oh, maybe yeah. he will become a key player. Maybe he will have to do some important mission um, the way these archetypes sometimes do. Um, so I think there's still there's still a big question mark around where he's going, but I definitely think that's that's a big part of who he is. Do you think yeah. Javi's still alive? What's your personal thought on that? Yeah, I think Javi's probably still alive. I'm not sure. I think it's interesting. I think we'll have to see a little bit more about like where he ends up. I think he like carved that wolf, which is interesting. So I think that he has some connection to the wolves as well. Um, so I don't think his like time is up. Um, and I just think he's like, I don't know. I think it'd be kind of sad if, if they ate Javi. <laughs> Absolutely. He's such a great I'm character. I'm rooting for him. <laughs> Same. I hope he makes it out of the woods. I mean, yeah. you know, I'd love I'd love for that adult casting to happen and see yeah. where, you know, adult Javi think, is. Since he started off as this sort of blank slate, it would almost be like an unfulfilled arc for him to just kind of die <laughs> before he we kind of That's see true. the like foil of that beginning into whatever he is now that is true an unfulfilled arc i like that mm -hmm. um and you know the last one you had mentioned in your article was jackie and what did you call jackie yes i called jackie the pretender to the throne because yes. she thinks she's the queen she is in a sense kind of the conventional queen of a different story but now we have left that story behind us and she doesn't like understand that she's found herself in in the fairy tale now and that just behaving as she behaved when there were different sort of conventions and norms in play isn't going to like get her what she wants and I think like Lottie exiles her and then people cut her down and I kind of said that Shauna executes her and she does in a sense she really cuts her down even though it's not literally with a knife um and that in the end leads to her doom. But, you know, since it is a fairy tale and Shauna's already kind of seeing her ghost around, um, I think that we could definitely see Jackie continuing to appear in ghostly forms and having having real power in that way. Like, oh, yeah. even though her character is no longer alive, she can still be alive in this supernatural story. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's funny, like all these archetypes, um, even though they're related to a fairy tale, I do think they apply very much so to, you know, the TV show and yeah. and the, the cannibal council itself. I mean, <laughs> essentially, you know, you this whole concept of archetypes is a hierarchy and mm -hmm. there's a very clear hierarchy. We have the antler queen in the middle, her court around her. It is so similar to the structure of a fairy tale. I I think your observations are just so spot on and mm -hmm. um, incredibly informative. Yeah, it was yeah. a really, really nice article. Thank you. Yes. I really appreciate it. I had like a really good time writing it. Um, and I really think it did kind of just all like come together. Like you can really like see how these like famous fairy tale figures are shaving this story, which is why I think strongly that people should – read some of it as a fairy tale and not be so concerned with like well it can't be magic that's not realistic it can't really happen because we know it's like a realistic fiction where they just you know the plane crashed I think that like just putting it down to like this madness or like imagination and then it's like the question of like well if the imagination is powerful enough isn't it real it's real to them so it's real to us um and I think that kind of these examples really show us why we might want to really consider like allowing for that supernatural aspect when we watch the show. Yes, yeah. I, I think it makes sense, you know, if it is a fairy tale to suspend our disbelief and just kind of go with it. The writers have created this whole world and it's our job to, you know, accept it for what it is. And, um, you know, Thank you so much for your insights with the fairy tale concept. I absolutely love it. And um, thank you for joining us. Hey, so listen, you guys, go and follow Ro Rusak. She is on Twitter at Moondancer1626. Yes. Um, 
and you are also the news editor for Nerdist. So mm-hmm. make sure everybody follows Nerdist everywhere. And uh, do you have any more Yellow Jackets content coming up ahead of season two? Yeah, I mean, it's like we're still a little far out, but definitely we're going to like regroup on, you know, things people should remember, things like that. And then I think I, just speaking for myself as as a fan and, you know, a, a creative mind and a writer, like I'm excited to see what the next season has in store. And I'm sure it will be super inspirational when, when we do see it. And I think already I'm, like we were saying, in sort of the little teaser we got the little taste of season two we got we can see that this this idea of kind of these elaborate fairy tale images these wilderness parties and these goddess feasts are definitely like already there like the animal masks like i think you're gonna discuss and all of that is really giving like Shakespeare, folklore, all of that good stuff. So I'm really excited to see it because I love diving into those kind of tropes and stories. Um, And I love it when things get magical. So (laughs) yes. Well, hey, maybe you can join us again once season two gets here and, you know, we can break some things down, talk a little bit more. Um, But thank you for joining us. Um, If you want, you can hang out backstage and watch. If not, no big. Um, We will reconnect on Twitter. So Ro, it's been a pleasure. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Thanks, everyone. Bye. All right. Well, that was awesome. Gosh, what good insights. I feel like that literary perspective is definitely, you know, one way of looking at the Cannibal Council. So I love Ro and everything she had to say. That was fantastic. It's like out of the box thinking for a lot of people. Like I don't think a lot of people would think to view it this way. So it's interesting to view it from a different perspective. Absolutely. And, you know, there was also a Reddit thread um, from Nefarious Every 65, and she talked about this as well. You know, the archetype roles, um, the leader, the warrior, the mystic, the thief, um, like in the movie Seven, the guy wanted to fulfill the seven deadly sins. She brought up maybe, you know, does Cabin Daddy aim to fulfill the roles of the hunter, wolf, butcher, and trickster? Um you know, that, that's a fascinating idea. And yeah. you know, she, speaking of like queens and fairy tales, she also brought up, you know, the four queens missing from the deck. When will they reappear? I don't know. That's a good question. But I'm sure they'll reappear because there's a reason for everything. Yeah. And um, yeah. So, you know, she also mentioned kind of like the next generation fulfilling the roles of the previous. Perhaps, you know, Sammy could be Lottie of the next generation, the seer mm-hmm. or visionary, given the way that they film those car accident scenes. Um, you know, Shauna is the butcher, Ty's the wolf, Nat's the hunter, Misty the trickster or the witch, you know, in, in Rose comparison, Lottie the seer, Van the jester or, you know, the, the knight. Um, so anyway, there's, there's a lot to the archetypes. I think it's, um, I think it's really interesting and let's, um, specifically now get into who of the cannibal council in the pilot script, we see different roles mentioned. Emily, call out what this page of the pirate script mentioned, uh, the pilot script mentions in terms of like the overseer and all that stuff. So we know that the overseer is Misty and the shaman is Lottie, but Marie also said that they referred to the shaman as the Oracle when they were filming, right? Yes. Yep. That's correct. They say that the uh, the butcher we assume is Shauna for obvious reasons. Yep. Um, And the hunter is the person wearing the skunk on their head, wearing the co-ed naked shirt. That one, honestly... I, I like go back and forth as to who I think that is. Same here. You know, I mean, with the co-ed naked shirt, you want to think it's Van, of course, but at the same time, like, you know, that the skunk is, is the hunter, right? They're the one that's like holding the bow. So Mm -hmm. like, I think it's Nat. I think Nat somehow ends up with Van's co-ed naked shirt and the pink converse. So, you know, that's, that's my guess for the skunk. A part of me for a while thought that it could be Ty, but I don't think it's Ty anymore. Right. Um, You know what? Let's play one of the clips from Marie. Um, As we've mentioned, we did an interview with uh, Marie Schley, who's the costume designer from Yellow Jackets. We've got a few clips we're going to play. Let's start with this one. Ashley and Bart, the two writers, always knew where the show was going. 
And, but we, so when we were kind of concepting the idea during the pilot and when you do the pilot, you're really setting the look for the whole, you know, the whole trajectory of the storyline and all the characters. And um, they, um, you know, we would have to be like, well, who is the antler queen? We need to know who it is. <laughs> we can tie it in a little bit to what that character is wearing or, um, and there were certain things that they knew and certain things that they, we had to obscure because they hadn't really figured out that story point yet. So that's interesting because, you know, essentially they don't know who some of these cannibal council members may be. So that's a big part of why they did have to obscure them. Of course. Oh, sorry. I Eva. Think, no, it's okay. I think that like when they shot the pilot, like they were really unsure as to who a lot of those people were. And I think now they have an idea as to who those people are. That makes sense. And I mean, it's definitely safe for us to assume that the known survivors are, you know, a part of the Cannibal Council. Yeah. Um, so that would mean, you know, Misty, of course, we know 100 percent, the only one we 100 percent have seen her face. She lifts up her mask, of course. Um, she is the overseer wearing the beaver fur. Mm -hmm. Um we can assume Lottie is probably the antler queen, um, yep. Van, Shauna, Nat, Travis, and Ty. So we believe there are eight members. So that means there's another spot up for grabs. That could be Javi, Ben, Akila, Mari, Crystal, or an unknown JV. Um, what are your thoughts, Emily? What do you think? Who's the eighth? I personally think it's Javi because I will die on this hill that Javi is behind emptying Travis's bank account in the present day. Like that's just something that I've thought since the show started and I'm going to stick with that theory. So I think Javi is the one that's wearing what looks like he has the, the socks that are tied together. And if you'll notice the height differences in this yeah. photo, I mean, that person is substantially, substantially shorter than the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, we know Lottie is is definitely taller. So, you know, maybe it could be one of the shorter girls. It looks like they are wearing one of the yellow jackets. Yeah. Letterman jackets. Uh, shout out to Showtime. Thanks for sending us our Letterman jackets, by the way. <laughs> um, so you know what? I mean, it, it could definitely be Javi. Although in my mind, I also thought like the rabbit should be Shauna, right? Because of all of the rabbit symbolism. But we think Shauna's the butcher and the butcher's not the rabbit. No, no, so. at least not from what we saw in the pilot, like what you can make out of this person. Like when you see the shots of Pit Girl having her throat slit, that person is not wearing that th those socks on their head that make them look like a rabbit. No, well, that, I guess that's not the slitting one. But yeah, um, so I don't think Shauna is the rabbit. I mean, I do think mm -hmm. Shauna's the butcher. So, you know, um, it could be Javi. I mean, the rabbit could definitely be Javi, um, one of the acolytes. Emily, why don't you define the word acolyte for us? So accolade is a person assisting the celebrant in a religious service or procession. It's also known as an assistant or a follower, which I feel like calling them followers in this instance is a more accurate term. Yes. Um, and, you know, Marie talked a little bit about the acolytes and the different furs and all of that. Um, let me pull up another clip from her talking about the animal furs. You know, we talked a little bit about the animals and, you know, what animals you could use. Um, our friend yeah. Phoenix wanted to know, um, you know, how they decided on what animals the characters would wear, <laughs> um, you know, which we did talk about. We talked about the wolf. Um, we saw the skunk and raccoon. Um, yeah. Is there Misty's, any other? Misty's mask is a beaver beaver okay okay, okay. Um, all right we had that and then we had um the owl is that an owl um that's an opossum that is an opossum oh, okay okay that's a possum possum raccoon bunny yeah i mean we had to Sunk. get some real furs so that we could make the fake furs look real we had to be right. like okay this is <laughs> the the skunk took some some time to make um yeah but you can see that that's a and that's like a sleeve of a, a of a of a sweater, and we made oh. gators out of gloves out of sweaters, and we tried to give it layers so that it looked really it looks scarier. Yes, warm. Yes. <laughs> 
Oh, I love her. She gave us so much good information. And, you know, one thing we chatted about with her also was that, you know, there's a couple of members of the Cannibal Council that are not wearing identifiable animal skin. So tell us Mm -hmm. about this picture and which ones are not in known animal skins. So in this picture, we see Misty and then next to Misty is the, the hunter. And then that's Karen Kusama. Um, the antler queen somebody behind the antler queen that doesn't have an animal fur on are they it looks like ty almost doesn't it could that be ty and the wolf maybe i don't know it's definitely possible yeah um because you can see more of that person's face than you can see of the people wearing like the ones with the actual animal furs on their heads Yes, it's like they're wearing a mask or mm-hmm. a, ba- a ba- balaclava or something. Um, and then we see the the pink raincoat pink jacket. Yeah. Yes. And that to me looks like they're wearing like a face mask, like you had to wear for like COVID. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so yeah, there are a couple that are not, you know, exactly known animals. Um, let's see. I was looking for the next clip from. Uh, Sorry, lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, Okay, you know, one other thing I wanted to note, too, was with the skunk. You know, we've talked about that a little bit here. Uh, In Native American culture, which I realize, you know, they're in Canada, so um, some of this translates into Canadian indigenous culture as well. The skunk symbolizes humility with confidence. The power to assert yourself without being aggressive uh, is a rare and valuable quality. Um, That came from Danielle D. in the Facebook group. And, you know, I think that that really defines Nat for me, right? The yeah, humility with confidence, thing. power mm-hmm. to assert yourself without being aggressive. Um, you know, I, I do think that definitely reads that yeah. to me. Um, the beaver that Misty is wearing, um, same thing in indigenous cultures, the beaver is often seen as a symbol of prosperity and abundance. The beaver's furry coat is also said to represent physical and spiritual warmth. The beaver's lodge is another important symbol. They design the structure with great care, and this is the important part, to protect the beaver's family from harm, mm. which I, I think is interesting because, you know, in a way, like Misty plays that witch role Ro is talking about in the fairy tale, but also like she is a protector, you know, in a way she's trying to protect, you know, the adult yellow jackets. Exactly. That's why she kidnaps Jessica. Because- exactly. She wants to keep them safe and wants to make it so their secrets don't get out. And she brings them to her little, like, beaver lodge. Like, she, yeah, (laughs) she felt justified in doing it, like, even though it was so crazy. Yes. Um, And, you know, there are a lot more... um, Canadian indigenous animal meanings. These are totem animals that are pretty common in Canada. Um, The bear, uh, the teacher, often misunderstood, welcome, friendly, uh, strength, learned humility and motherhood. Um, There's the wolf, loyalty, success and perseverance, the eagle, the raven, the whale and the beaver. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the raven, to me, that looks a lot like the shot that we see from the season two Mm -hmm. teaser. The same thing. Yes. So, you know, we'll get into this more towards the end, but you can see clearly from that teaser, you know, there's an owl and then there's a bird next to it, which could Mm -hmm. definitely symbolize the raven or, you know, it could be a symbol of Caligula, you know, Misty's sidekick. That's so true. Um, You know, while we're here, we may as well just uh, just talk about this. Another theory I had about it was, you know, that one there looks like biscuit, right? Could each of these masks represent an animal that each one of them has sacrificed? Like, is Misty crying because Caligula was a sacrifice and this is like a representation of that? Hmm. I, don't, I don't know. Could Misty maybe be the owl because, you know, or actually maybe Nat because she destroyed the owl diffuser that Misty gave oh, her. Yeah like more figuratively right it yeah. looks like that bottom one like does that look like a goat to you like the very bottom horns that we can kind of kind of make out a little bit if i had to guess i would say yes 
Yes. And we know in the behind the scene pics from season two, we saw Christina holding that little baby goat. So Mm -hmm. maybe, you know, there's something with the goat. I feel like they released that behind the scenes photo for a reason. So that could be something. Um, It does look like there's seven here, though. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I wonder if there is an eighth or not. And we just like can't see it. Yes. And then, of course, you know, we do see a rabbit there. I wonder if Shauna would be the adult rabbit. Just, you know, again, why do they put all those rabbits in there if for no other reason? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot to speculate on in this adult one, especially, you know, if we're comparing it to to this. Right. Um, yeah. And like, what are they doing wearing the masks in the adult timeline also? I mean, you know, we see them dancing around in a circle. You know, like Rose said, we we might see all these like fairy tale performances, the feast, the dancing, you know. Um, so if like if like su- sacrificing something does come into play in the adult timeline, like I feel like those masks will tie into that somehow. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. Yeah. Um So let's talk about the what and the why of the Cannibal Council, right? So we know we talked about the who and, you know, speculated on the animals, but the why. Um, You know, Marie talked about them um, gathered around a fire doing some sort of um, ritual or ceremony. And um, let's watch another one of her clips. Responsible for creating the Antler Queen costume as well. Tell us from start to finish, from the second you knew, you know, there was going to be an antler queen, what that process looked like and like the hair, like how, how did you come up with all these incredible details? Well, I knew that there was going to be a, in the script, it was written that there was a ceremony at the end where they're eating, they kill someone and they're eating this body and everyone was dressed in fur because it was like cold, (laughs) basically. (laughs) that's pretty funny that they based, you know, all of that just on the ceremony around a fire. Um, But I think the fact that they call it, they were calling it a ceremony is significant. Like if they're describing it that way for a reason, like why would they tell the production crew like, Oh, this is a ceremony. Like if it wasn't some kind of a ceremony, like I think everything that they do that we see when they're wearing those outfits is very deliberate and very structured and like planned out like from start to finish. Absolutely. And and not only just the costuming, but also the time of day, you know, the pilot yeah. script is very specific with how they mention the times of day when all this is happening. Um, You know, wilderness, late day, our eyes adjust and we realize we're moving through a dense forest, light filters through the woods, giving us a brief glimpse of a runner. Um, Okay. So it's, it's late day. Right. And then in this next page, it talks about, um, you know, the fading light. And then we see the mysterious figure in animal pelts, um, angle on the runner, late day continued, the co-ed naked shirt. Again, another page, late day continued, um, the wilderness in the clearing, the woods abruptly give way to a clearing surrounded by a skeletal white birch, the runner skids to a stop. And then, um, you know, we hear those inhumane whales. Mm-hmm. And then in this last one, it is dusk, the pink strains of dawn just starting to peek through the dark silhouette of trees sound of rope pulled taut against the wood, a rasping creak. Um, So I think that's very intentional with those times of day. Like it does indicate a very specific ritual or ceremony and maybe it's an all day thing. You know, maybe they, they perform the hunt, you know, at daybreak throughout the day, you know, they do the butchering and then culminating in the big feast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At first, when I first watched it, I thought that the the hunting and the all of that was happening at like dawn, but it makes more sense for it to be happening in late day because the sun is coming up when they're like hoisting her into the tree. So that yes. makes more sense. Yes. Yep. It is definitely very light out uh, upon the hoist. So yeah. definitely. Um. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it also just kind of goes to show, you know, you had pointed out 
the how far their descent has been into the society that they created for themselves out there, you know, like adopting this ritual, um, yeah. splitting into clans, you know, how did this all come together? You know, we know doom coming was obviously, you know, kind of a, a start for it, but it's amazing to see how much they've actually evolved with creating these ritualistic ceremonies. Like it's, it's like their own religion, their own fairy tale, their own world out there. Like Roe, you know, is referencing. Yeah, and like she said in Doom Coming, like Lottie pretty much like becomes the queen and everybody listens to her and does what she wants them to do. So I have a feeling that's going to carry over and like the ritual that we see is going to she's going to be largely responsible for a lot of what we see happening, I feel like. Like she's going to be the one that makes a lot of the suggestions as to what they do, like the whole timing, like and I know we've talked about this before, like it might have actually have something to do with like the moon, the moon cycle as well, because yes. at doom coming, they point out that it's going to be a full moon. Like when, when they have their party, their celebration that turns into doom coming. So we've speculated that maybe the hunt coincides with something involving the moon. Yes. In our symbol episode, we talked just a little bit about how I believe it was 1997. There was this particular lunar event that only comes, you know, a certain amount of years and that would coincide with their time in the wilderness. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, I believe that it had to do with the um, like the sextants or the the directional like moon positions or whatever i can't remember i specifically, feel like but... saturn was involved for some reason i think saturn was involved you're absolutely right and there's something that's supposed to like happen during that time um of that particular lunar event so mm -hmm. could definitely be tied into the moon um you know another thing we talked you know about misty pretty heavily in this because of course we know she's confirmed to be in the cannibal council she seems to have a lot of power within this yeah. hierarchy which is somewhat surprising given some of the things that she's done out there and you know the group probably didn't have a lot of trust in her so what do you think yeah. happened that gave her this power position within the council Honestly, I have no idea because I just keep going back to in like the very last episode when they get the bear and they're like cutting up the bear and Mari says to her like what like we'll trust you around the food and then she like tells her like get the fuck away like don't touch anything like so how does she go from being banned to helping prepare food to presenting the rest of the group with a tray of food like why do they give her this trust why is she given this job? Like, and we know for a fact that she's one of Lottie's first followers because we see her kneel behind Lottie in the finale. So I feel like that has something to do with it too. Like Lottie may reward the people that believe in her in some kind of a way. And you may be rewarded by having like an important job or something like that. Absolutely. I think that makes sense. You're definitely given special privileges within the court um, yeah. of, you know, the fairy tale hierarchy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that does make sense. But it is a pretty big jump to go from poisoning everybody, you know, inadvertently with mushrooms, not being around the food to like literally serving up human meat on a platter to the rest of the crew. So some people on Reddit have like speculated that they think that like she was still poisoning them like oh. after everything like she she like because she has access to the food so maybe she was still poisoning them in some way i don't know like what benefit she would get out of that but i mean she's crazy so maybe she doesn't need to get anything out of it <laughs> you know that is uh very true um and you know here's a, another clip from marie about kind of like the easter eggs and the ceremony and that sort of thing let's watch this whole idea of all these easter eggs like we didn't that wasn't like something that people planned in the pilot. It's just something that evolved out of that process of designing the pilot and what uh, restrictions we had, you know? So, um, <clears throat> but it ended up being a really fun part of it. And so we leaned into it. And so Dune coming was really fun to come back and do that because I really tried to tie in those looks as early ideas towards where we're going with that like cannibal council thing you're calling it but basically that <laughs> ceremony that they have around the fire. 
What did you guys call the group of people having the ceremony around the fire? Was there a name exactly. that the crew had or that, that was it? The, you know, Cannibal Council was adopted by the fandom. So you guys didn't have a special little nickname for it? No, we only knew that it was a ceremony of some kind. Okay. The fandom has come up with such good names for so many things involving the show. Yes. You know, I love MFQ. That's like one of my favorite little nicknames for our favorite Misty. And, you know, you are credited with creating the name Cabin Daddy for <laughs> Dead Hunter Guy, which is maybe one of my favorites. You know what? Yeah. We need to talk to Will and get him back on for a Cabin Daddy episode. Let's yeah, put that on our, our list of things to do. Um, okay. So now that we've talked a little bit about, you know, big picture, we've talked about the hierarchy, some of the animals. Let's talk about the creation of the antler queen starting with another clip from marie responsible for creating the antler queen costume as well tell us from start to finish from the second you knew you know there was going to be an antler queen what that process looked like and like the hair <clears throat> like how did how did you come up with all these incredible details well i knew that there was going to be a ser in the script it was written that there was a ser yeah, that was definitely the wrong clip. Sorry about that. Um, okay, let's watch this one with your question about some of the specific costuming with the Antler Queen. I just have one question about the Antler Queen. Now, when you see her antlers, she has something hanging off of them. Like, are those earrings? Yeah, they're earrings. Okay, okay. It's so I was always so curious. It. And then yeah. she has, you can't really see it the way it's been shot, but you can see it in this photo. She has some um, antler wings as well. Yeah, she has back antlers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. So one of the things that's fun about that um, scene is like, we knew we couldn't show who these people were because it's a mystery, but also we didn't really, we don't, we still don't really know who the acolytes are. We were calling them acolytes. Um, Yes, that was very cool. And speaking of the Antler Queen, something we've speculated a lot about, you know, on Reddit and Twitter, do we think Lottie's the permanent Antler Queen or do the antlers change hands throughout? Emily, tell us what this poll result was. So we had over um, 1,100 votes and 585 people voted that Lottie is our Antler Queen the entire time. 379 people voted that it switches hands at some point in time out there, and 147 people voted they were unsure. Yes. I personally believe Lottie is the antler queen the entire time. Um, you know, that's that's my personal belief. But, I mean, it's all, all fodder for speculation, right? Um, I mean, who knows? Yeah. I don't think her. anybody else will take the role of Antler Queen. Like, I think Lottie will have that role, but there might be somebody else that, like, overthrows her in the power position at some point. But they will not become the Antler Queen, if that makes sense. Right. No, that that completely makes sense. Um, Let's take one more look. This is our last clip from Marie, just talking more about the costuming specifics, especially the human hair and how they created the costumes based on knowing it was going to be so cold out there. The, the Antler Queen, the Oracle, the fans have called it the Antler Queen, but, um, and now it is the Antler Queen, let's face yes. it. So, um, but yeah, I mean, so we knew it was going to be cold and we were like, how are we going to cover their faces? We can't show skin color. We can't show hair. Like one of the things about choosing the hair that was going to be on the Antler Queen is that we didn't want to have too many different styles because then people would be guessing whose hair it is. And so we just kind of went with dark hair um, and not too much of it. You know, there was a, definitely a lot of discussions about how much human hair was going to be on that. Um, and, and it is human hair, right? It, it's yes, actual yeah. human hair. Okay. A hair salon and um, where you buy <laughs> extensions and yeah. um, you know, and it's different kinds of hair. It's curly and straight. And, uh, but you know, and the idea there was like, we don't know if those are victims or if someone else, someone just cut their own hair off and put yeah. it on. So it's like, it's, it's, it gives the writers more room to like try to figure out what, how to get to that place, you know, because we had to leave them some room. Um, but with the, yeah, and same thing with the acolytes, we couldn't show skin, sh couldn't show hair color. And then I found some um, images of some African warriors had made sweaters into balaclavas. And so I'm like, oh, that makes sense. It keeps them warm. They have their sweaters. They need to cover their faces up. 
Um, we used pantyhose in some. I really love this image. Uh, we used a raincoat um, because Karen in my first meeting with her was like, I love this pink in the snow. And I'm like, I'm going to find a pink raincoat. It's also so girly and it's like a tech fabric against the uh, fur, which is nice. Yeah, we used tights and we kind of made them into these different creatures, which is really fun. Oh, gosh, it was so nice talking to Marie. She had so many little gems about, you know, creating essentially the whole aesthetic for the the costumes for the entire show. I mean, yeah. And so much went into it. Like it was such an extensive process, like seeing how they aged the shirt from like nothing to what it ends up looking like when the person standing over the pit is just it was just so cool. Right. Absolutely. And of course, you know, if you have not watched our Coed Naked episode, um, we did speak to the owner of Coed Naked, Mark Lane. Um, he talked about the history of Coed Naked, you know, it appearing in yellow jackets and, you know, speaking to that aging, Emily, as you mentioned, they just did such an incredible job. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the Canadian team won some awards for their aging, uh, wardrobe yeah. aging. Um, and, you know, speaking of that episode with Marie, we are going to drop the full episode um, next week. Uh, we've just been kind of using some clips here and there. But, yes, you will be able to watch the entire interview. So don't worry. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one other thing we wanted to do was also show some really cool fan art. This is by yeah. Reddit user Claire's Dragon's Den. And what a beautiful rendition of the Cannibal Council. I love this. Yeah, it's so good. There's so many creative people in this fandom. I like anytime I see something like this, like I just want to share it because it's just so awesome. Same. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we had a couple of questions from the live stream here. Let's show the first one. Uh, this is KL05904 asking, how much do you think the girls remember from Doom coming? I just rewatched season mm -hmm. one. Amazing. And I'm still not sure. That's a good question. That's a good what do you question. think, Emily? I feel like they remember like bits and pieces because when Shauna wakes up that morning, like she sees the knife on the ground and when she grabs it, like it's almost like she sees flashes of what happened and they were very like sporadic and not consistent. Like with, it's not like she was seeing what happened from start to finish. She was only seeing like little bits and pieces. So I think they remember some, but I don't think that they remember everything. Right. And I mean, that was definitely the beginning of their descent into this, um, you know, tribalistic fairy yeah. tale world out there. Doom Coming was my favorite episode of season yeah. one. I mean, gosh, there's actually so many favorites I have, but I think Doom Coming's my favorite. Yeah. Um, of course, we're we're in the middle of doing a rewatch as well because we're going to drop our season one recap soon. So everybody can use that to kind of refresh their memories before watching season two in March. So. Yeah. What I love about it is like picking up on new things every time we watch. That's my favorite thing about Yellow Jackets. I know. I still notice new things now. Yes. Um, another question. Let's see. Or actually a statement. Um, Mia mentioned, you know, uh, Misty was the first believer with Van. So I think that does really solidify, you know, why Misty has this uh, place within the hierarchy. I think there's definitely, um, you know, as Mia mentioned again, that's exactly what I think. If you influence the beliefs, you'll get rewarded. Um, yeah. or you could be like Jackie and just not buy into it at all. And like, you're dead. So sorry. <laughs> um, yes. And then let's see, uh, Mia had one more question. I'm starting to wonder how much these girls packed. I know they gathered everyone's belongings, but still, um, I mean, you know, with the dead people, like they got access to the dead people's clothes too, I guess. So that helps like their wardrobe situation, but um, I think it was important the show creators mentioned the girl sharing clothes because that yeah. does, you know, not guarantee just because we see the co-ed naked shirt that that's Van. You know, they intentionally aren't revealing that as, you know, Marie kept mentioning. Like there were some things that they just had to keep obscured. So um, for yeah. that reason alone, that makes me think it's not Van wearing that co-ed naked shirt just because like they've stressed so much that they share clothes that – seeing it on one person means nothing. So just because we've seen Van wear it more than one time, that doesn't mean that it's her. No, I know someone on Facebook, <clears throat> excuse me, had pointed out that, um, you know, Marie had posted something to her story with the side by side of the 
you know, co-ed naked shirt on the hunter with Van. But I mean, Van did wear the co-ed naked shirt. So mm -hmm. I think that's more why she would have showed that versus trying to like spoil that it's Van. Yeah. I don't think Marie's given us any spoilers. So <laughs> I, I think, think that so is either. that is safe to assume. And um, our friend KLO5904, can't wait for that full interview. I know you guys are going to love it. Marie was so wonderful and she shared so many gems with us. Yeah. And then one more. So glad this live coincided with my lunch break. It's great <laughs> to have this interactive time with fans. Oh my God. Thank you so much for watching. And, you know, we totally agree. Um, it is really fun to do the live streams. We've done a lot of them recorded before. Um, and for anyone looking for these live videos on our YouTube, they're under the live tab if yeah. you don't see them first. So, you know, be sure to check that out. Um, yeah, I mean, Emily, do we have any other things to spill on regarding the Cannibal Council? Any other comments? I don't think so. I think we covered everything we wanted to cover. I agree. I agree. So what we're going to ask of you, um, Hive Babes, Acolytes, um, why don't you drop um, oh gosh, we still have this comment up here. Huh? Let me get that off. Oops. <laughs> um, why don't you drop your guesses in the comments or, um, you know, on social media, wherever, who do you think these cannibal council members are? We would love to hear your thoughts. Do you think Lottie's the antler queen the entire time? Who do you think's wearing the pink raincoat? Do you think the bunny is Javi? Um, I do think that one next to Javi does look a lot like Ty potentially wearing a wolf thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of speculation. Hopefully we get some answers. We should at least get to figure out who our eighth member of the cannibal council is in season two, I would imagine. Yeah. Yes. I hope they reveal another person like somehow, like just like they revealed Misty in season one. Like if we don't get to that, point, like, I don't think we're going to get to that point this season anyways. So maybe they'll reveal another person in a similar fashion. Like, like we've speculated before, like maybe we'll get more of that pit girl scene, like either like before what we see happens or after what we see happens. Like, and then maybe eventually we'll get the full sequence of events, which would be really cool. Yes. I waver between wanting to see an extension of the pit girl scene as the first thing we see for season two or Nat waking up in Lottie's like cult room or whatever. So, I mean, either way, season two is going to be great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we just want to thank all of our uh, viewers, all of our listeners. Um, please visit yellowjacketshive.com. We've got all of our links there. If you listen to us on Apple or Spotify, we would absolutely love if you would rate us five stars and leave a review. Um, and yeah, continue to watch our live streams. Um, we will be letting everybody know the dates and times on social media. So be sure to follow us. Um, Hive After Dark on Twitter, Yellow Jackets Hive everywhere else. Yes. Yes. And with that, we would like to thank all of you Hive babes. We would like to thank uh, Ro for joining us today. Again, she's the news editor from Nerdist. And she wrote that phenomenal article about the Yellow Jackets as fairy tale archetype. So don't miss it. We'll drop the links on our socials for that as well. So yeah. um, thank you, Hive Babes. Yes. Until we spill again.